I unfortunately am only now discovering the awesomeness of Dan Barker. This debate with George Pell covers a lot of ground, and I think Dan Barker does a great job of explaining a lot of atheist arguments with an erudition and clarity that I have seldom seen in other presenters. George Pell, on the other hand, seems to be intellectually on par with Peter Hitchens. For atheists, the universe is a product of blind chance, has no purpose. Perhaps a, just a brute fact. So humans are like the froth on the wave. Sometimes pretty, sometimes dangerous, always inconsequential. Pell is another one of these guys who seems to think that if a human being's significance is finite, humans therefore are not significant at all. I think people's lives can be immensely consequential. The fact that the consequences of our lives don't endure for an eternity in no way means that our lives are altogether inconsequential. People can have an impact that is significant for centuries or millennia. Another mystery of life is the origin of the coding and information processes in all life forms. The cell is a system which stores, processes, and replicates information. Flew became a theist, he changed his mind, after studying the directive capacity of DNA, whose genetic message is replicated and transcribed to RNA and into the amino acids, which are then assembled into proteins. How blind and purposeless forces would spontaneously produce such a process is unknown, and I believe unknowable, uh, metaphysically impossible. Why would it be metaphysically impossible? DNA is simply a pattern. Apologists often talk about information like it is some spooky supernatural entity that can only be encoded into molecules and atoms by a conscious mind. This is bullshit. Information is simply a non-random pattern. If a rock falls into some mud, the shape of the indentation it makes in the mud will contain information about the contour of the rock's surface. The replication of DNA and DNA's role in protein synthesis is a more complex example of essentially the same phenomenon. So, so, without God, are we nothing? Let me ask you atheists and agnostics in the audience. Are you nothing? No. Aren't you something? Aren't we biological animals? Don't we come with instincts and drives and even, as George points out, purpose to reproduce, to live, to, to enjoy life? Are we nothing? Who would dare insult our species by saying that our wonderful, beautiful, learning imperfect and yet struggling to improve species is merely nothing. I don't understand how theists can fail to see how ridiculous it is to think that human beings are inconsequential without God. There's no evidence for a God. Come on, if there were evidence for a God, we would have heard it tonight. George would have put it on the table and said, here's the evidence for God. Instead, what we heard was evidence for mystery. And George went out of his way to remind us that his arguments are not gods of the gap arguments, but in fact, that's exactly what they are. Here's a mystery. How do you answer it? God did it. Pell seems to think that his arguments are not God of the Gaps arguments because instead of just saying, we don't know how life began chemically, therefore God, he said, we don't know how life began chemically and I think it's metaphysically impossible, therefore God. This is still an argument from ignorance. Even if it were metaphysically impossible for life to arise chemically, it would not therefore follow that God done it. If Pell can't fathom how life began chemically and he therefore can't believe it, fine. But he seems to think that a disembodied mind created life essentially by magic which in my view is even harder to fathom and seems to be much more likely to be metaphysically impossible. And therefore I find it harder to believe than the notion of chemical abiogenesis. And to say that he somehow lives outside of time means that he doesn't exist. To live outside of existence is not to exist. Uh, no one has ever properly defined the word spirit or spiritual or supernatural. Those are simply words. Uh, George, in his works, uses the word beyond and wider. The spiritual word is beyond, it is wider. But what does the word beyond and wide mean? Aren't those dimensional words? Aren't those natural words? Until you theists define properly the word you are using, you may as well just say God is a blum. Because what does the word spirit mean? How do you measure it? How much does it weigh? How much space does it take up? How does the spirit differ from nothing at all? Isn't it just a word? A problem that is common in theological and apologetic discourse is that a lot of concepts are undefined, or at best are defined by what they are not. They say things like, the spirit is made out of non-physical substance, but if you ask them what the hell that is, they usually only say that it's like the substance that we encounter every day, the substance that makes up rocks and chairs, except it's not that. They'll say that the soul and God don't have any extension or location in space and time. Since that's the case, I've never been able to figure out what it means to say that such things exist at all. 
all. What does it mean to say that something exists if it doesn't exist somewhere at some time? They will use words like beyond space-time or sometimes above space-time, but these are spatial designations. I have no clue what these words are supposed to mean if they intend to refer to something that is independent of space-time. What would it even mean for something to be independent of space-time? So, with God or without God, are we nothing? Tell that to those millions of good people who find that it is true, there is no purpose of life, nor should we want there to be a purpose of life. If there is a purpose of life, that cheapens life. That makes us less. It's like the hymn that says, God, you are everything and I am nothing. If there is a God, we are subservient in the universe. We are secondary. We are children. We are slaves. If there is a God, we are truly nothing. Theists often speak of how they think that the existence of God gives dignity to human life, but how does life become more dignified if its existence is due to and subservient to a creator, especially one who, we are told, created us primarily for his own glorification? Here I sped up some of George Pell's remarks because he speaks like a fucking slug. I uh, spoke for 10 minutes, talking um, about the uh, intellectual patterns, the, uh, the beautiful principles, fantastic equations, the miracles of life that are... Uh, exist within the universe and uh, say that they require to be understood an intelligence. They can't be just uh, the product of uh, a brute uh, chance. Notice he uses the words intellectual patterns. What the fuck does this mean? I think he intends to give the impression that the fact that the universe behaves according to regular patterns that are described by the laws of physics indicates the existence of a mind which created those patterns. Why would this necessarily be the case? Why does a pattern or regularity necessarily require an intelligence? To assume this is to assume that the default state of reality is chaos. I see absolutely no reason why this would be the case. Hence there's only one difference between this and that is that I, uh, he believes in one less God. Uh, no, I, I prefer to put it another way. I'm offering an explanation, and so far what Dan has done is uh, just uh, offered an affirmation. God is no more of an explanation than magic is. An explanation, or a good explanation at least, is a falsifiable idea about how something works that allows you to make testable predictions about how that thing will behave in the future. God, as a concept, simply does not do that. God cannot be used to give any such predictions about the universe that cannot also be given by much simpler naturalistic theories. Now, of course, uh, I realize that atheists exist. And of whatever I meant by without, or whatever the title means, without God we are nothing, is not true in that sense. My, my claim is that without God, there is nothing. Stuff exists, therefore God. Sounds logical, right? We can't define God, because to define, you put a person in a, in a species. Um, we can't, but we can say useful things about God. God is intelligent. God is uh, spiritual. What does it mean to say that God is spiritual? And on what fucking planet would such an assertion be even remotely useful? There's no definition of the spirit. With the kids, I say, think of your parents' love for you. It's very real, very powerful, quite invisible. Honor, forgiveness, disgrace, they're all powerful spiritual uh, realities. I think they're all emotions carried out by the brain, but even if that were not the case, these are only examples of what you think are spiritual things. You still haven't given a definition of what spiritual means. George makes another assumption in his re remarks that uh, that which is mental is non-physical. I don't think anyone supports that claim. I think believers might support that claim. Me a mental activity is a physical activity. It is a description of a function. Thoughts are not things, they are functions. Be like me saying digestion is a thing. Digestion is just, it's just a label for the function of an organ. Thoughts and mental processes are labels, are, it's a label for functioning of an organ. You cannot have thoughts without some kind of an organ functioning. If the stomach disappears, digestion disappears. If the brain dies, our thoughts die. Mental activity is not immaterial. Sometimes I use the analogy that thoughts are patterns of activity just as software is. Thoughts are patterns of brain activity just as a computer program is electronic activity. A rebuttal I've heard a few times is that software is actually immaterial just as the soul is. That's when I know that I'm talking to an idiot. And when I ask people who say this what a thought or a mind or a spirit is if it is not brain activity, they have never come up with a definition. Can you define for us what, using positive terms, 
what is a spirit and how that would differ from nothing at all in positive terms? Um, I've just said that I can't uh, define God, but I can uh, say something useful about spirit, uh, and I just repeat what I said because I believe in the reality of love. I believe it's a spiritual uh, quality. I believe honour is something that is real. Disgrace is real. Forgiveness uh, is real. Something spiritual is um, invisible, but uh, sometimes it can be uh, very, very powerful. The love of a husband and wife, the love between parents and children, they are the most, uh, probably the most important realities in many people's lives. They are spiritual realities. See, those are just examples. An example is not a definition. The French uh, adventurer and writer, Minister for Culture under the Gaul, André Malraux, said that no atheist can explain the smile of a child. Pfft, that's really dumb.